It's probably the most slides you're going to see me do in a row the whole quarter long. But we do need to cover some basic architecture before we dive into the next part of the demo, which will be the second half uh, of today. Any questions before I start? Okay, good. All right. So lecture number three here. We got two huge topics to talk about. One is MVVM, which is the architecture, the design paradigm that you're going to use to build an app. And then the Swift type system, the different types that are in there like structs and protocols and all that. So those are two major topics. And then I'm going to dive back in the demo and we're going to start building the game logic for our Memorize app, right? You know, we need all the things about what happens when you click on cards and all that. We need to build all that. All right, so this MVVM thing, what's that all about? Well, in Swift, to say that it's important to separate the logic and data of part of your app from the UI would be a dramatic understatement. It's really, really important. Swift UI, in a way, is all built around this idea that you're going to have your data and logic, what your app does over here, and then you're going to have the UI that shows that to the user and interacts with the user as a separate uh, thing. So that's just really important. The logic and data side of it, so in our Memorize app, it's the what happens when you click on a card and are the cards face up or face down, all that stuff. Uh, we call that part of our app the model. You're going to hear me use that word model hundreds of times. All that stuff lives in the model. We call the stuff we've been doing so far in class the UI, or sometimes we'll call it the view because it's our view, our portal onto the model. Now, the model, it could be a single struct. It could be a whole SQL database full of stuff. Um, maybe it's some machine learning code. Maybe it's like a REST API over the internet. It could be almost anything. It's conceptual. Our model is conceptual. It's not just a single uh, struct. Although with our Memorize app, it is going to be a single struct because this is super simple little first starter app. But I don't want you to think that your model couldn't be way, way more powerful uh, and complicated. Now the UI part of our app really is just like a parameterizable shell that the model feeds. One of the best phrases I've heard for the UI is it's a visual manifestation of the model because the model is what your app is. It's a memorized game. That's what it is. So all that logic is in the model. The UI is just how you show that to the users. It's a visual manifestation of it. All right. So you really want to think of it that way. For what we've done so far uh, is face up, card count, these things that we've been putting in at sign state, they belong in the model. Those are all things about the game we're playing. Right? So we don't want those things stored in UI. We'll be getting rid of them, putting them into our model. Now, one of the things that Swift does, super important, one of its responsibilities is to take to make sure that anything that changes in the model appears in the UI. So it's got an enormous amount of infrastructure to do that for you. All right, that's one thing you have to understand. You're not really going to be responsible that much for making whatever's in your model appear in the UI. Swift is going to mostly do that for you. You just got to give Swift some hints about what in the model affects your UI. But once you do that, it's going to do it. So don't worry too much about that part of it. Mostly you're going to worry about separating these things out. If we separate these things out, the UI and the model, how do they connect to each other? Because obviously they need to talk to each other. Well, I boiled it down to three different ways of connecting it here. There's probably some other ways, but I think most things would fit in one of these three categories. So rarely, one way we could connect the model to the UI is to have the model be at sign state in a view, right? I mean, if you put the entire model, all the logic you app, into an at sign state in your view, then obviously your view uh, could access it. Well, this is extremely minimal separation. It probably wouldn't do that. I'll talk about when we would do that soon. Uh, number two is that the model is only accessible to the UI via a gatekeeper. Okay, so we're going to have a gatekeeper, and that guy's job is to keep the UI and the model communicating with each other safely, coordinating communication. This is the main way we're going to do it. This is this MVVM thing I'm talking about. 
Number two here is 99% of the time you build an application. And then I throw out number three here, which is kind of a hybrid of the first two, which is there is this gatekeeper, which we call a view model there, uh, but sometimes it'll allow direct access to the model. It'll have a var that's public that the UI could look at that var and actually talk directly to the model, directly to the memorized game. Uh, that's a hybrid of the first two, essentially. So how do we know which of these things to do? Well, the easy answer is always do number two. <laughs> okay, that's what I'm gonna advise, just always do number two. Especially when I, that previous slide when I said the model could be SQL databases and all these things, you definitely need number two in that case. Because the, the, this thing in the middle, this intermediary, it's the thing that knows how to do SQL and all that. You don't want your UI to have to be making SQL calls. <laughs> Your UI is just presenting information on screen. It, it should all be simplified for your UI. Uh, so that's why you would always do uh, number two. But a very, very, very simple model, even simpler than our memorize, it might want to do this at sign state solution, especially if the view maybe just comes on screen really briefly. It has a little bit of data that maybe it's like image data that it's showing or something like that. And then it goes away and it's gone forever then maybe you don't need this extra gatekeeper guy. Uh, and then the third one is maybe you're in between. Like our memorized game could be that hybrid. You're gonna see when we build our memorized game, yeah, we have this intermediary, the gatekeeper, but a lot of time the gatekeeper is just forwarding on requests from the UI directly to the model. So you could make the argument, ah, eh, just let the UI see the model directly and still have the gatekeeper to do some other bookkeeping uh, I don't like number three because as your app grows, you start building a tangled mess where your UI is now talking directly to your model through this gatekeeper guy, and it just doesn't grow very well. It doesn't, it's not a flexible growth system. So even though you might have to do a little bit of work uh, to protect your model from your UI with this gatekeeper that seems a little bit like, why are we wasting our time doing that? Uh, it still can be worth it, especially as your app grows and becomes more powerful. And you'll see that in the demo, because I'm gonna show you both number two and number three uh, in our demo. We're gonna talk about number two, this MVVM. The reason it's called MVVM, that stands for Model View View Model. That's what the MV and VM are. The model, you know what that is, I told you. Your view is another word for the UI. And view model is this gatekeeper in the middle that I was telling you about. It's kind of interesting name, view model, because its job is to connect the view to the model and be the gatekeeper between the two. So I kind of like the name view model, weird word, but that's what we're gonna see. So here's a picture of MVVM. There's my model over there. Here's my view. And we'll get to the thing in the middle in a second. So let's talk about the model in this whole architecture. The model is UI independent. We are not even gonna import Swift UI in our model. It is truly UI independent. In our memorized game, it's gonna play a game of memorize with anything on the cards. JPEG images, we're gonna use emoji, but it can do anything. It's a generic UI-less memorized game playing thing. UI independent, important to understand that part in the model. As I said before, it's the data of your app, like whether the cards are up or down, and the logic, like what to do when you choose a card, which cards to flip open and stuff. It's both of those things combined. It's very important to understand that the model is the truth for all of these things. So if you want to know the data or you want to perform some logic, you have to talk to the model. There's no copying this data somewhere else, like into this view model thing I'm going to show you, or certainly not into at sign state in your UI. You would never do that. You, if you want the information, you go back to the model. It's the truth. You always, anything the model knows, you should always be asking the model for it at all times. Now, let's talk about the view. What is the view? Well, the view, as I said, it's a visualization of the model. The view should always look like what the model looks like. Whatever's happening in the model, you should see that on screen. The view, because of that, is stateless. You see, it doesn't hold any state. It's just always showing you what's in the model, so it doesn't need any state. That's why any state we have in the view, we mark it at sign state. So we realize, oh, we have state in our view. That's not good. This is supposed to be stateless. It's, it's okay to have at sign state in very rare circumstances, but it's unusual and it's specially marked like that so that we are aware that we're doing this thing that really 
is rare. The views are mostly stateless. They're just showing you constantly what's in the model at all times. You probably already noticed this, but our view is declared. Okay, we don't write the code for our view in an imperative fashion. You guys know what the word imperative means? That's like when you're writing code, you're calling a function, then you call another function to make something happen, and then you call another function, you're writing imperatively. In our view, you noticed we just had our var body and we just listed the views that went our UI. We modified them with view modifiers, but we basically just listed them. They're just sitting there, a stack of, you know, cards and the buttons. It's, we're saying what it is. We're declaring this is our UI. And then the model data drives it. Any part of our UI that can vary is, is changing because our model is changing and causing it to change. So we declare, so it's declarative. And that results in this word we see a lot, which is reactive. That's because the UI is reacting to changes in the model. Model changes, UI updates, because it has to, because it's always showing what's in the model. So now we can talk about this MVVM thing, and it works like this. We're going to introduce another actor into this thing, the view model. And the view model is going to bind the view to the model. Its job is to connect these things to each other. So this line that comes across right here says data flows this way, read only, right? Because this is stateless and it's being fed by this. This guy up here is going to intervene in this line. And he's not only binding them, he's also interpreting them. Like this might be SQL, and this doesn't make SQL calls. So it's the thing that has to make SQL calls, turn them into normal variables or something so the view can see them, right? So it's doing interpretation of the model. It also is a gatekeeper between these two guys. It's protecting the model so that the UI can never do anything bad to the model. And I'm going to show you how it does that, the main way it does that in a minute here. So it's a gatekeeper, an interpreter. It's the thing that controls the flow here between these two things. So basically that line goes up and through there. Okay, the data flows through the view model to the view. How does this all work? Well, things happen in the model, and it's this view model's job to notice those changes. So again, SQL database, it's got you know, it's signed up with the SQL database to get notified when things changes. If it's a Swift struct, fantastic. Swift, really good at telling you when something in a struct changes. And you'll see why that is when we talk about the type system. Whatever it is, the view model has to notice the changes. Now, when it notices the changes, it then publishes to the whole world, something changed in the model. So once the view model says something changed, that's when Swift UI kicks in. And it looks at its view and says, oh, something changed. Did anything change? That means I have to redraw. And it's super smart about this. It's only going to redraw the views that actually were affected by this change. And it does that for you. So you don't even have to worry about it. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. All right? So this is the process. Notice change. Publish a change has happened. System Swift automatically figures out which views have to be redrawn, and it draws them. How does it know this, by the way? How does it figure this out? Again, it's all about this functional programming, about the fact that structs in Swift are value types. We can see when they change very easily. It's built in to know when they've changed. Uh, that's all because of Swift. Swift enables this to happen. And we're not going to talk about the mechanism for that right off the bat here, but it's pretty cool. I'm just putting these things here, like this view modifiers and these little at sign things with like at sign states, but they're different at sign. But I'm just putting them up here for future reference. I'm not going to talk about any of them right now, but later in the quarter, when you see me talk about one of these things, you can think back and say, oh, I'm going to go look at that MVVM slide and see. Oh, yeah, that's right. It was an MVVM thing. So we'll, we'll be talking about like observed object and observable object and published in the next lecture or so but some of the other ones a little later in the quarter. So that's the basics of MVVM going this way. But there's a big question here. Well, what about the other way? Because the view, you can tap on things, right? You can swipe and do things. The user can interact here. They could affect the model. So how do we go that way? Because I told you this arrow only goes this way, and it does only go this way. Well, that is done by processing user intent. And that's another thing the view model does. 
when someone taps on something in the view, they call a function in the view model saying, the user has the following intent. For example, in our memorize game, the user wants to choose this card. You're not going to have a method in view model called tap. That would make no sense. That's a UI thing. You would have a method in view model called choose this card. You see, it's a user intent. The user intends something semantically meaningful to the model. But then once again, the view model's job is to turn that into a bunch of SQL calls or something like that, whatever makes sense, to express that intent in the model. All right, so it's very important, this idea of intent. Now, sometimes intent like choose a card, our model, our memorized model, it's going to have a choose card method. That's just fundamental to it. So it's going to seem kind of weird, like our view model is hardly doing anything. It's just forwarding the message on. But it's still being a gatekeeper. It's still, you know, binding them together. It's just that our first app is really simple. But the second app we build, you're going to see that there are intents that can't be mapped directly to a single call in the, in the model. But anyway, that's what happens here is intent. Now, what happens when that intent gets called in the view model? Well, of course, the view model modifies the model, whatever the user, in, to express whatever the user's intention is. Then what happened before happens again. The model changed. The view model notices the changes. It does all this publishing. If something changed, the view does its thing and it updates. Same exact thing that's happened before. So when it comes to going this way, the only thing is the intent. Once you call the intent, view model updates the model, and then the normal update happens, right? Our stateless UI is reflecting the new state of the model after the intent that we expressed. And that is it. That is the entirety of MVVM. So let's go to the next step in our architecture here, which is the type system. Every language. It's just so important to understand the fundamental types that are involved, right? Because everything that the language can do really flows out of those fundamental types. So let's talk about the types here. Now, I don't have time because I wanted to do some demo today to talk about all the types. So I'm going to talk about structs and classes, and then these don't care types, which are kind of fun. And then protocols, I'm going to talk a little, half of about protocols. That's why I say protocols part one. I'll talk about more protocols in lecture five or so. Uh, I'm going to skip enums, not because enums aren't important. They are. Enums are important type, but I just don't have time to do everything. And I do need to talk about this last type, which is functions. And yes, I'm talking about types here. Functions are types. So let's talk about these types. Struct and class, very similar. So I'll kind of compare them in these first two slides. They have almost exactly the same syntax. And you've already seen it, right? You say struct content view, colon view, class, very similar. But inside there, they both have vars that can be stored, like is face up, right? It's just a stored variable, normal variable. They also both have computed vars, like var body, right? We compute the value of the var. They also both can have constant lets. Remember, lets versus var, lets are constant, vars are uh, variable. Both have functions, and I just want to remind you here then in functions, our uh, parameters here can have names like operand and by right there. And that they can also have two names, an external name and an internal name. The blue is external name and the purple internal name. Right? We use this on the inside. Callers use the blue name. We saw that in the last demo. And they both have that. Constructs and classes all have all these things. They also both have something we haven't talked about, which is initializers. Now, we saw a rounded rectangle when we created it. We created it with a corner radius of 12 or whatever. But when we were typing corner, it also was offering us this other one, corner size, where we could kind of do both the X and Y of the corner, not just a radius. And that's because the rounded rectangle has two initializers. And you can have any number of initializers you want, and they can all have different arguments. You can take whatever arguments you want, as long as you initialize your struct or your class, that's fine. Now we haven't needed any initializer so far because, and I'll talk about this in the next slide, we've used the free init. You get a free init with structs and classes. They're different, but you get a free one. And we have been using the free one, like when we created our card view, we use card view open parentheses content, remember that? We got a free init there that allowed us to call that, and I'll talk about that in the next one. 
in the demo, we're also going to write our own in it because it is flexible and nice to be able to specify your own arguments to create your thing. They're really simple. It's, it, init looks just like a func, but you don't say func init, you just say init, and you can have as many of them as you want. When we create our memory game over there, our memorized game, we're going to initialize our game with the number of pairs of cards we want. Even though number of pairs of cards is not going to be a var, we're going to have an array of cards instead. So what's the difference then? Struct and class got all these things all exactly the same. What's the difference? Well, this is really important to understand. And what's good about this is understanding it not only from the Swift language perspective, but because most of you are coming from object-oriented programming. And so you're used to classes. And Swift has classes. And so when I'm comparing structs to classes, it's kind of like comparing what you know to what you're going to be doing. Because you're going to be doing 99.9% .9 structs in this class. Okay, we're only the only thing we're going to use a class for, believe it or not, is that view model. <laughs> that gatekeeper thing, that will be a class. But everything else will be a struct. All right, so the biggest difference between structs and classes is that structs are value types and classes are reference types. Does anyone know, think, raise your hand if you think you know what that means. Okay, a few of you. So a reference type means that when you have a variable that is a class, you don't actually have the class stored in that variable. You have a pointer to it. It lives in the heap somewhere. You have a pointer to it. You have a reference to it, right? It's a reference type. And that's what you're used to. Okay, almost all languages, object-oriented languages, they have reference to their classes. Now, what's good about that? Well, I guess what's good is you could have 20 different pieces of code all sharing the same class, right? They all have a pointer to it. They can all modify it and everything. What's bad about that? Well, you could have 10 different things all pointing to the same class and they're all modifying it. And how do you know one of them's not screwing it up for everybody else? So. That's the good and the bad of reference types. It turns out Swift believes the bad outweighs the good. So they don't use reference types for most things in uh, Swift. So what's the alternative? Value types, what does that mean? Well, a value type means that the storage for the variable is actually right there. And there's no pointers. It's actually stored right there. And it also has some things that fall out from that. For example, when you pass a, a value type to a function, it, you get a copy of it. In fact, even when you assign one variable to another, you just made a copy of the other one. Every time the thing gets passed around or assigned, it's getting copied, copy, 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 not pointer. And why is that good? Because if you give a copy, like you pass it to a function, and then that guy mucks it up, he only mucks it up for himself. He didn't muck it up for you because you gave him a copy and he worked on it. Now. The flip side of this is it requires a lot of different thinking, okay, when you're writing your code. For example, if you have a struct and you want to give it to a function to modify, then you would give it to the function, they would modify it, and they would probably return you the new one, right? So the return value of the function, like here's that new thing you wanted. And you saw this actually probably when you looked for array shuffle, right? There's array shuffle, which shuffles the array in place. That only works if you have a var. And then there was shuffled with a D on the end, which gives you back a new ray shuffled, you see? And that shuffled, that's more the kind of swift way to do it. Now, we'll, we'll talk about in a couple of bullets here how we do the shuffle in place when we have this going on. I'll explain that in a second, but that's important to understand. And then you get the class, again, you're passing around pointers, so everybody's pointing to the same thing, they're all sharing it. Now, another interesting thing is, if you have a class and you're handing out all kinds of pointers to it, when do you know how to clean up the memory, right? When do you know I'm done with this object, this class? Well, in a lot of languages, you do garbage collection, right? And you go look in the heap, you do a mark and sweep, nobody's pointing to this, I'm gonna clean this up, whatever your strategy is. Turns out Swift's strategy is a great one, it's called automatic reference counting, where it keeps track in real time. How many pointers are there to this? And when that count goes to zero, it immediately cleans up the memory. So it's really nice, uh, even though we don't use classes, it's still really nice that they have this feature in there. So what happens on the struct side? On the struct side, it uses copy on write. Because when I say that you're passing these things around by copying them, I mean all structs. If you had a array of a million items in there, 
When you passed it to a function, it would copy it. Now, that would be impossible if it was really a million items in terms of performance, right? You, you can't copy a million item array, but arrays are struck. So what happens is when you pass it behind the scenes, it's not actually gonna copy it until someone writes on it. And once someone modifies that array, now they get their own copy. And they, so there's, the whole thing is based on copy on write. Now, when you have copy on write, guess what? You know when things change. You have to know when that array changed or how do you know when to copy it? Well, I told you before in the MVVM, Swift's really good about knowing when structs change. It's built into Swift to know this struct was actually changed. All right, that is just fundamental because it can't do the copy on write otherwise. And without the copy on write, constantly passing around arrays of a million items would just not work. It just wouldn't work. And it's, this works incredibly well. Swift is incredibly efficient. If you build your code, even if you're processing large data sets, it's really, really efficient because it does this copy on write built in to the very language. Now, as you're probably getting the message here, structs are the foundation of functional programming. They're right at the base of what we're doing. Classes are the basis for object-oriented programming. Why do we choose one of these styles over another? Well, object-oriented programming came out of this idea, I just talked about it before, data encapsulation, right? We want to encapsulate the data of a real world concept or thing, and then associate all the functionality with that data by encapsulating it all into one structure with functions about that data, right? That's what object-oriented programming is. I think we can all agree. And it adds this idea of inheritance because some things are very like other things, but with you know some minor modifications. And so we can inherit from them and then tweak them to be uh, a specific instance of that or whatever. That's great. But functional programming has a different take on it, which is that it's not the data that we wanted to encapsulate, it's the functionality. So all we're gonna really do is describe how things behave. I've already said this before, right? Like how a view behaves or whatever. We're gonna describe that formally in our language, and then we're going to be able to know which things can do what, and we can ask them to do it. And when it comes to the data, that's behind the scenes. Like how an array stores its things, who cares? Okay, what we know is that an array has a whole bunch of functions and bars on it that we can call that'll do certain things. And we don't really care about the data, and we never care about it, and if it totally changed its mind about that, we wouldn't care too. Uh, so functional programming, it's fundamental to functional programming that we have these value types because in functional programming, one of the real things we want is provability. Have you all heard about the, this concept of provability in computer science? You want to be able to take a piece of code and prove that it will do what it will do no matter what, no matter what environment it's in or whatever. You can't do that in object oriented programming because you don't know who's gonna have a pointer to your class who might mess the whole thing up, increment some counter or do something like that. Whereas here with functional programming, you can because you're always passing a copy of the thing in there and it does what it does and it returns the modified thing back. So it's just, that's always gonna happen. Nobody can interfere with that from outside. That function will always do what it says it's going to do. And you can prove it with test cases or whatever, you can prove what it's doing. So it's just a different way of thinking about programming, much more about provability uh, and functionality based design and this is much more about data encapsulation and kind of modeling the real world although we can model the world just as well in functional programming because in the real world things behave like certain things so we can do it there too just as much all right so there's no inheritance at all in structs because inheritance is limiting it, it, you know if i had two things that are kind of similar but one's not really a subset of the other it's like ah, they want to share some functionality but they can't you see they can't inherit Inheritance is limiting unnecessarily. So there's no inheritance. There is inheritance, of course, in this side because Swift is trying to be uh, an object-oriented language and also it has to have backwards compatibility with the old way of programming in iOS, which is all class-based. Uh, so it has single inheritance, regular normal inheritance that you're used to. This init thing, I told you we got a free init. They both get free inits, totally different. A struct, the free init you get is an init that initializes all of the variables, is face up and content, all of them, right? And of course, if any of them are defaulted, then you don't have to put them on there, but you get that's what you get. If you don't do your own init, you get a free one that has all. With a class, if you don't do your own init, you get one that does none of them. 
but it still requires that all of them be initialized. So the only way you can use the free init in a class is essentially is if you put is equal to something for every single variable. You have, they have to all have default values because you only get this free one. So in classes, we almost always have inifs because this is such a weak free init. In structs, we often don't have inifs because the free one is so powerful. In object oriented programming, the objects are always mutable. You have a pointer to them. You can always go through that pointer and change the object. Dangerous. That's why anybody can change your object. It's dangerous. Here, in structs, mutability is explicit. If something is in a let, you can't mutate it. If it's in a var, you can. So if I had an array and it's in a var, I can call shuffle on it because shuffle shuffles it in place. Or I could call append to add something to it. Or I could subscript it and assign one of the things to something else because it's a var, it's in a var, stored in a var. If it's in a let, things like shuffle don't even exist. Now, if you call shuffled with a D, that would work, right? Because that doesn't modify the array. It just shuffles it and returns a new one to you. So this is explicitly managed, which is really awesome as a programmer to know that you have some piece of state that can be modified or not. It's just, it's wonderful. It would, so the question is, can I use a let for a class? You can, but all you're talking about there is the pointer. The thing it points to is always mutable. Okay, the pointer's not mutable, who cares, right? I mean, you have the point. Lets are allowed, but they don't really mean much over here. Uh, so yeah, so structs are your go-to data structure. 99% of everything you're gonna do in this class is a struct. We're doing functional programming here. Uh, sometimes you'll hear me also say, because uh, whenever I say functional program, I always throw in there, or protocol-oriented programming, you can call it that. I'm going to talk about protocols in a second. You'll see why I keep throwing that in there. Pure functional programming doesn't have some of the things that Swift does with its protocols. So it's a combination of functional programming and um, uh, protocol-oriented programming. And here, we either use this for backwards compatibility to the old iOS, which none of you are going to be doing. That's six years old by now. Old news. Uh, or we would use it for our view model. Now, why do we use a class for our view model. Here's why. Our view model is shared, very much shared between maybe lots of different views. Lots of views want to get at the model, right? I might have a score view in my memorized game. It wants to show the score of the game. So it wants to get at it. So you want to have a pointer to the shared view model, the shared view model that's, that's looking at the model. But the key here, the reason it works here is that the view model is a gatekeeper. It has walls up against, that are protecting the model, right? That's its whole existence is as a gatekeeper. So having a shared pointer to it, it's not gonna get damaged. Its whole job is to not allow damage. It's, its whole interface, the whole programming interface to it is a protected gatekeeping kind of interface. So it's a time where we can take advantage of the shared nature of having a pointer to it, that we can hand out the pointer to all these views, but we're safe because its whole job is to be a gatekeeper. All right, generics. So I talked about this earlier, array, right? And an array of ints, array is kind of a generic because you can put anything in there. Let's talk about how this really works, this stuff. Sometimes you wanna build a struct and it has some data associated with it and you don't care what type it is. Array, the classic example there. Um, we call that being type agnostic about that type. Uh, I like to use the phrase, it's a don't care, because I don't care what it is. Swift, though, is strongly typed. Remember I said that? That's a problem, because you gotta know what that type is. Swift doesn't, Swift does have a thing that is not typed, but it's just for backwards compatibility with that old iOS stuff, okay? We never use it when we're actually using Swift. So Swift is strongly typed. Every single thing, every variable has to have an actual strong type. And then we do that nice type inference to make it so we don't have to type it so much, but they all still have a strong type. So if we're doing array and we want to have ints in there, we have to have a type for int. So how do we specify this type we don't care about? Well, we use generics, and here's what the syntax looks like for generics. We're going to imagine array, and let's 
pretend that we're uh, going to write the array struct, okay, we're the authors of it, uh, we're going to need to have variables and functions that are of this don't care type. Like if I say append to the array an int, well that, uh, that append method, its argument has to be of type int. So I need that type when I'm building my programming interface for array. So let's look what it would look like approximately if we were to build our own struct array. So here it is, struct array, and it's got its functions and bars in there, but it's got angle bracket element. And that angle bracket element means I'm array, I have a don't care called element. And this element can be any type, any type in the entire Swift type system here, well, except for maybe a function, I guess, but it could be a, certainly a struct or a class uh, or an enum. And this type is something that array doesn't care what it is, but it's going to use it in its, a, its programming interface, right? Func append, there's the element, it's of type element. So when does this thing become a real type? Well, of course, when we create it. When I say var a equals an array of int, now element is an int for me. Whenever I'm using a, element is an int. So append takes an int, subscripting returns an int, or sets an int, it's as simple as that. So you notice that this angle bracket thing, it kind of matches what the guy who wrote struct did. Angle brackets right, after, brackets right after the name, angle brackets right after the name when you're creating one. I think the thing that makes this hard to understand is people are like, well, I can't really think of an example of when I would use this, <laughs> right? It's like array, yeah, I get it, of course. But so in our demo, we're gonna do that. We're gonna create our own generics. It'll make a lot more sense uh, when I do that. Here, I just want to emphasize that you could have multiple of these generics. So array could have multiple. You can declare as many of these don't cares as you need, right, to define your class. It's totally allowed there. All right, so this is actually called type parameters because we're kind of parameterizing the array type with that little element thing. Uh, but I, I'll call them don't cares. I just think don't care is much more visceral. It like, makes much more sense. That's a don't care. I don't care uh, what that that type is. Uh, now, one thing about Swift's don't cares or its generics, it really uses them a lot. It's really fundamental to Swift and we're gonna combine it with protocols and it's really gonna be powerful. Once you throw protocols into the mix of these don't cares, I, I'll give you a preview. Imagine that you have a don't care that you force to behave like something. Okay, now you've made your don't care be, oh, I care a little bit about this. And that allows you a lot of flexibility to build uh, programming interfaces. We'll see that in our demo. We're going to do that in our demo as well. And so I won't talk about too much about it. But before we can talk about that, we need to understand protocols more. And again, I don't have time to talk all about protocols, but let's get a little bit of an understanding of what's going on with protocols. You already have seen the view protocol, so you're probably already getting an idea. Let me talk a little more formally about it. Protocol looks like, when you see it in code, kind of like a class or a struct that has no implementation. Right, so here's a protocol called movable. And it's got a function, move by some int. It's got a var called has moved, and another var, distance from start. But notice, no implementation here. The move by has no curly braces after it, and the two vars just say get or get set. So the curly braces after a var in a protocol just say whether this is a read-only var or a var you can get and set. That's, that's all that appears in the curly braces there. No implementation. So a protocol is just a description. I'm sure you can all make the leap quickly to why do we do this? Because we're just describing behavior here, just functionality. We're not actually providing any functionality. We're just saying we want to have things that behave like a movable. And if you want to behave like a movable, you need to implement movable, which means you need to implement move by and has moved and distance from start. So remember that when we said we behaved like a view, we had to implement var body. If we want to implement movable and behave like a movable, we have to implement all three of these things. When you claim to implement a protocol or you claim to behave like a protocol, you have to implement all the things in that protocol. Really no way around that. I use this thing behaves like a, it's the same way as like I call it don't care, don't care. It's just more visceral here, but 
conforms to is really the right words. When I have a struct that uh, does this colon movable, we're saying that portable thing conforms to the movable protocol. Okay? I, I like to say it behaves like a movable, but that's the, the real words, the real thing we'd say. So everyone understand that? That's what, what a protocol is, just a functions and bars, no implementation, just so we can say that other things behave that way. It's a, just a little, so we can make contracts between objects, basically. It's also legal to have protocols, like protocol vehicle, that behave like other protocols. There, it's kind of like, we call this protocol inheritance because vehicle has its own var, but it's inherited these ones. So if I want to have a car, which is a vehicle, I have to implement all four things because I've inherited both of them. So that's protocol inheritance, that's totally allowed. You can also, of course, have uh, your car or whatever implement multiple protocols. That just means they have to implement all those things. In other words, I'm just saying here you can have comma, another one, comma, another one. And it's actually quite common to do this. We'll be doing this in our demo. We're going to implement multiple. Uh, we're going to behave like multiple things. Uh, so what do we use a protocol for? Well, we do this, have this thing. What do we use it for? Well, a protocol is a type. I'm talking about the type system. It's a type. And so you can use it as a type, a type of a var or as an arg type that's passed to a function. Uh, var body, actually, it's return type, or it's just the var, but it's type, that var byte, it's a view, something that behaves like a view. Of course, we got the sum in there, which makes it so it automatically calculates it for us from our, you know, computed property, but it is a type view, and view is a protocol. Um, so you can do that. Uh, I'm actually not going to talk about that <laughs> right now, even though that seems like, wow, that's really important. Uh, it's really, it is important, but there's other things that are more important. So I'm not going to talk about that. That will be in part two of port protocols. How do we use a protocol as just a type, a type of a var or a parameter? So what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm going to talk about the way you've seen it already, which is super important, which is to specify the behavior of a struct, a class, or an enum, right? We say struct content view behaves like a view by doing this. And we know that when we did this, we had some things we were required to do, like implement bar body, and that we got a ton of things, a whole bunch of funk, you know, view modifier functions like foreground color and all these things that apply to all views. I call this constraints and gains. So this is using protocols for constraints and gains. You're going to constrain some structs and classes or enums or whatever, like constrain them such that they have to implement var body if they want to behave like a view, but you're going to get gains, like a whole bunch of functions or whatever. And this constraints and gains idea is true for all uses of protocols. Protocols are always constraining because they're making you implement certain things, but they provide a kind of a framework for you then to get a bunch of gains. And I'm not going to talk a lot about the gains. It goes back to this extension thing, how we make this happen. But constraints and gains is a big part of what protocols are all about, right? Huge gains. So we're going to see quite a variety of protocols, even in the next couple of lectures, like identifiable, hashable, equatable, custom string convertible, animatable, tons and tons of protocols. Uh, and pretty much in everything we do, we start doing these protocols. And we do it so that we can both constrain things and gain things. Uh, another use of protocols I hinted at before, which is to turn our don't cares into care a little bit. So if struct had been declared as array of element where element behaves like an equatable, then you could only put things into arrays that you could do equals equals on. Because that's what the equatable protocol is, equals equals, right? When you say the x equals equals y, that equals equals is actually part of a protocol in Swift called equatable. So if, luckily they didn't <laughs> define it this way because we can put things into array that aren't equatable. And had they done it using this where clause, see that magic word where, we could constrain that don't care to be a care a little bit. And we're going to do that in our demo as well. All right, does that make sense what, how we could use protocols here? It's just a way to make our don't cares a little more like we care. All right, so more about protocols uh, in part two. Once we add extensions, uh, they're going to be, we're going to, the gains part of constraints is going to go off the charts uh, over there. And we're also going to talk more about some and any, you know, like some view, and there's another one called any, 
that are really good for using protocols as types. Like when you want to put things in array and you want any, you want the array to be any kind of a certain thing that behaves like something, then you have this nice any keyword that helps you put that in there. So we'll learn all about that in protocols part two in a couple of weeks. Here's an overview of protocols, just understanding why do we do this protocol stuff? It's just a way for structs and classes and enums and stuff to say what they're capable of and to demand certain behavior out of other structs, classes, and enums, right? That, that's what it's fundamentally about. But the great thing is that neither side has to reveal anything about what they are. They don't even have to say whether they're a struct or a class or an enum. They just have to say, yes, I implement that protocol. So it, it hides the implementation behind this protocol. And hidden implementation is good because you can then change it. On, you, know, you can change it without breaking anything because you've hidden the actual structure class that's implementing something. Uh, it's also a way to add a ton, a ton of functionality via this extension thing, which I haven't talked about yet. Um, it's really, when we say that Swift is all pro, protocol-oriented programming language, this is why we're saying this, because it's all about the functionality and we describe what the functionality is via these protocols. Right. That's why we say it's a functional programming language, protocol or pro programming language. They go together. Uh, this is why they go together so much. It's how we describe the functionality. All right. Functions. This is the last type in the type system we're going to talk about. The only thing to get from these slides, functions are types. Okay? They're first class types. And here's how it works. You can declare any variable or parameter to a function or the return type of a function to be of type function, right? And this syntax for the type function includes the arguments and the return type of that function. You can do it pretty much anywhere another type is allowed. There are some restrictions actually, but certainly parameters, functions, return values, variables, they can all uh, be of type function. So here's some examples. This one here in yellow, that is a type called a function that takes two ints and returns a bool. That's what that type is. There's another type. This type is a function that takes a Boolean and returns nothing. That's what arrow void means right there. This is a function that takes no arguments and returns an array of strings. And here's one that takes no arguments and returns nothing. It's a common type we see. We can have variables that are of these types. We could have parameters that are of these types that are passed to functions. They're just types. Here, for example, is a variable foo. Its type is a function that takes a double and returns nothing. Or here's a function, do something. It has an argument what, which is a type function that takes no arguments or returns a bool. So kind of exactly what you expect. The only thing maybe you wouldn't expect is, notice none of these include parameter names. So when you're specifying the type that is a function, you don't include the parameter names. Just the actual types of the return values and arguments. So how do we use something like this? Here's a var operation that's of type function that takes a double and returns a double. And here I have a function that I wrote called square. And square happens to take a double and it returns a double. Okay? It returns the operand times the operand. Do we all agree that that's a function that takes a double and returns a double? All right, well then I can say operation equals square. Because operation is of type function that takes a double and returns a double. And square is a function that takes a double and returns a double. So I can say operation equals square. And I can now call operation just as if it were square. I can say let result equal operation of four. And that's going to work because operation is a function that takes a, a double. This is a double and returns one. So result one's going to get it. And it's going to be 16 because operation is currently square. But I could reassign operation and say operation equals square root. So square root is a built-in function in Swift that takes a double and returns a double, square root of it. Now if I say let result equal operation of four, I get two, you see? Because operation is a different function now. I'm not gonna take the slide time here to show this doing the same thing for a function argument because we're gonna do that in our demo. Closures, you've heard me talk about closures. Uh, we often call them inline functions. We call them closures for a reason. Hopefully, if you're doing your reading, I believe we're covering that in the reading this week. Closures capture the environment of the variables that exist when the 
closure is inline, right? A closure is just an inline function. We've seen closures all over the place so far in the code we've done in this class. There's a lot of built-in support for it. Right? These view builders were closures. When we did the on tap gesture, it had closure. When we did buttons action, that was a closure. These are all closures. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about closures and how they capture the environment. I'm going to leave that to your reading, and then you're going to see me doing it in class. It'll make sense then. It actually turns out that on the UI side, the capturing nature of closures, we don't use it that much. Mostly, you can, if you want to think of closures as just inline functions, you can do that. But hopefully, closures now make more sense how they are arguments to functions. Like, remember ZStack? Content, colon, open curly brace, and then we put the view builder stuff in there. Well, content in ZStack is just a parameter to its creation, and its type is a function that takes no arguments and returns a view. That's all it is, nothing special there. That's all it is. The only thing that's a little special is that it's a view builder. So it has that magic that turns the list of views into one tuple view, combined view. So it's got that magic, but when it's declared, it's just of type, a function that takes no arguments or returns a view. We're doing functional programming here in Swift. These are really, really important, right? Closures, functions as types. Just We're just going to be doing this all the time in this class. I take some time on this because I know that for some of you it's like, whoa, functions as types, I can't imagine this. Uh, but it'll become very natural. And once we start having some variables and functions that take these as arguments, you'll be like, oh, yeah, 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 I get it. It's really, really cool. And it is really cool. All right, so that is it for the slides today. Like I say, that's the longest run of slides I'll do uh, all quarter, but those are two important things to understand, that MVVM thing and all these types. And so let's get back to the demo. And what we're going to do in our demo is we're going to start building the model for our memorized game. And then in the next lecture, we'll build our view model and hook it up to our UI. Here we go. This is where we left off last time. Now, I'm going to take a little time here to clean out a little bit of the code that we put in there. Uh, you were allowed to do this uh, in your assignment as well. I'm just going to go through here and remove these buttons at the bottom. I have these buttons down here just to clean up the code because you, you understand how that works. It's not really helping to be in our face. So you can remove this, the spacer and the card count adjusters there. We don't actually need this to be in a VStack, I guess. We could just have it be scroll view. Is that right? And we don't need the card count adjusters over here. By the way, one thing I would have done probably, you see how I created a one-liner card adder here? Once I added this, I probably would have put this up there in line. And it probably wasn't worth it to have this a one-liner there. It wouldn't be wrong, but it probably wasn't worth it either. And let's see, we don't need card count anymore because we're not adding or removing. So let's have this go back to being the uh, emojis indices instead. That's everything. Yeah, we're back to working over here. We got our UI. I'm actually not going to touch this UI in this lecture. Instead, we're going to totally do model only. And they're totally separated, right? So I shouldn't have to touch my UI, which I'm not going to. And I'm going to create my model in a totally different file. So I'm going to, in Xcode here, I'm going to go file, new file. That's how I add a file to my project. My model's going to live in a totally separate file. You notice down at the bottom it says user interface Swift UI view. That's one you might choose if you're creating a view. We're not. So we're going to choose Swift file. You almost never choose these other things unless maybe you're doing unit tests or something like that. Most of those other things, you're not doing C++, you're not doing metal. Probably, maybe for your final project you might be. Uh, but we're going to choose Swift file here. I'm going to call my model memorize game. Memorize game. And remember that it is the game. It is the actual logic and data of the game. One thing important to do, see what that group right there is? That's be, this is the group that is going to put the file in. This is something students really forget to do, so I'm going to take some time to make sure I make it clear what's happening here. Is you don't really want to put your files up at the top level where your Xcode proj is, right? You know, if you look in your directory you've got the xcode project and then you've got a, something there called memorize that's this folder that's where you want to put your files so one way to kind of make sure you're doing the right thing so if you click through this is the folder you want to put it in this one here 
if you don't do it, it's not the end of the world, but it's just going to start looking a little ugly because you're going to have random files, Swift files up at the top level instead of putting them down in this nice memorized. So we create it. Here it is. Here is our uh, model. And our model starts out saying import foundation, not import Swift UI. That's because we said create a Swift file instead of a Swift UI view. And that's exactly what we want here. Foundation, that module is just arrays and ints and bools, dictionaries, non-UI things. Nothing in foundation has anything to do with UI. And if you find yourself having to do import Swift UI here in your model, you're doing it wrong because models are UI independent. They should not have import Swift UI. Now, our memory game is just going to be a struct. So I'm going to struct memory game. And it's not going to behave like anything for now. So I'm just going to Put the curly braces after there. And when I build my model, one of the things I almost always do is try to stub out when I'm starting, what does this thing do? And what, it, what data does it have associated with it? Just to get me started, I might change my mind and use a different data structure or whatever, but I want to kind of make that clear in my mind, at least as some straw man before I start going. So our memory game, What's a guy? I should have left those cards up, although they probably wouldn't appreciate appreciated that in other classes, but, and I'm not taking them up and down because they take a lot of hooking up there. Uh, what, what does it do? Well, it definitely has a bunch of cards, right? Can we all agree that we probably need some kind of our cards? And it's an array of something. I'm not sure what. I'll call it the array of card. How about that? So I definitely want that. Do we all agree with that? And what is our, how do we play our game, right? We basically choose cards, right? Choose card, choose card and matches or not or whatever. So I probably need some function, choose a card. And it's also a little type card. And that's it. That is my entire model because that is all our memory game does. It has a bunch of cards, you choose them and it plays. Now, in your assignment two, you're gonna be asked to do some additional things like scoring. So you're gonna probably add something here the score, probably an int or something, a var int, or, or double if you want double precision scoring, uh, you're gonna add that. But for our basic game that we had so far, this is really all there is. But what about this card thing? It's saying cannot find type card in scope. So we're gonna have to think about what a card looks like in our model. So let's have a little nested struct called card. You see how I put this card inside this struct? That's not only allowed, it's really good for namespacing because the name of this struct is actually memory game dot card because I put it on the inside of it. And that's what I want because I don't want some generically named struct card floating around in my app. Maybe I'm building, you know, an app that has 20 card games in it. I don't want this card to be called card. I want it to be memory games card, right? So this nesting is really nice, but it's, almost entirely just a namespacing thing, but it's a nice feature there. So what do we know about a card? What kind of information it has? Well, there's whether it's face up. <laughs> That's a big one we know that it's gonna have. What else might we wanna know about a card? Anybody think of anything? If it's been matched. If it's been matched, absolutely. So we'll have an is matched. That's a bool. What else do we wanna know about a card? Yeah, like what's on the card? You know, I know I didn't bring a card today, but remember my cards had Halloween themed things on there, witches and spiders and things. So we got to know what's on there. So that's interesting. We'll call it content. It's the content of the card. What type should this be? A string, a string. If it's, we're doing emoji, right? Then string, because emojis are strings. I guess it could be character also. There's a type in Swift called character. And that'd be maybe okay, but I actually have a better idea. Let's make this a don't care. Because we're making a card game. We don't care what's on the cards. Put anything you want on there. JPEG images, emojis, whatever. So let's make this a don't care. So how do we put a don't care here? Well, first of all, let's just make up a name for it. I'll call it mm, card content. It's a type I'm just making up. And I could put it here, card content as a don't care, right? It becomes a no, don't care. But actually that's really not gonna work very well 
because that would mean here I would have to say what the type was. Because remember, whenever I have a don't care, whenever I use this thing, like here, I have to then say what it actually is. So that's a little bit of a conundrum, but easily fixed because I'm just going to take this and make the don't care be on the entire memory game. Now, memory game, including its little substructs here, all have this don't care. It can be used anywhere inside memory game. So that's one thing to understand about a don't care is the wider the scope you put it, the more it'll apply, right, to sub substructs. So we have this look, no errors. <laughs> We have no errors up here. And we got this card content. It could be any type. It could be a string for our emojis. It could be image, this JPEG image. It could even be some UI thing. And I said this was UI independent. It can't have anything. Yeah, but whoever creates this memory game is going to be in the UI, probably in a view model, right? The view model is part of the UI, by the way. The view and the view model, both considered parts of the UI. They're going to create the memory game. They could specify a UI thing because they're UI. That's part of it. So here, inside here, though, we are not doing any UI. So that's a cool feature, too. Your don't care can make it so that you can use things in the UI kind of through your model, but your, your model is actually still completely UI independent because it doesn't care. It does not care what you put on these cards. So that truly is just about all there is to do with our model here. We have five minutes left. Let me think about this. Yeah, let's do it. I'm going to create my view model. And we're going to come back to this. We obviously haven't implemented our memory games logic, but that's all there is to our memory game. It just has the cards. We choose them. They're face up, matched, content. So let's create our view model. This is the gatekeeper between this, our model, and that UI that we've built. And that looks like this. View, view, file, right here, new file. Again, it's a Swift file. It's not a view. View model is not a view. And I'm going to call this emoji memory game because this view model is going to be specific to emoji memory game. If I had one that was JPEG image or something, maybe I would have a JPEG image memory game. Now, it is possible I could also build my view model to be generic, and it could have a don't care as well. But I don't, I'm not going to propagate that up, but I could. It's totally legal to have don't cares on your view model. But I'm not too, for mostly for simplicity of this demo, I'm not going to kind of go that far with our don't care. So this particular view model is going to be specific to emoji memory games. This will only work for memory games where it's emoji. So here we go. We'll create that. And this one is going to import Swift UI because your view model is part of your UI. It has to be because, remember, it's packaging up the model for the UI. So it has to know what the UI looks like. It has to be part of your, your UI. But, I say that, but the view model is not going to be creating views or any of that stuff. Okay? The view is going to be doing that. But this will know about the UI, and it will know about UI-dependent things like colors and things like that, images. It knows about that. So this is a class because it's going to be shared amongst everything and I'm going to call it emoji memory game and a class if it had inheritance would be right here my super class or whatever we're not going to do inheritance we don't need to inherit for any, from anything to be a view model so we'll leave that off but it could also behave like something so you know something we behave like right some protocol could be here uh, and you could have one without the other. Like maybe I don't inherit anything, but I do behave like something. That's legal too. The only thing is that if you do have a super class, you want to list it first in that list before you list the things you behave like. That's the only restriction there. Now, my view model is uh, the conduit between my model and my UI. So it needs connectivity to the model because it needs to talk to the model. Right. If, for example, if the UI, the view had an intent, like choose a card, the view model has to be able to talk to the model and express that intent. So we almost always need variables here for our model. Now, I'm going to call mine model. This is a bad name. This is a name that you would only use for instructive reasons. Okay, You would call this something like game. 
because that's what it is. You always want to pick names, variables for what they are. I'm going to call the model just so you constantly are going to be reminded what model and what's view model. And when we go back to our UI uh, on Monday, I'm going to call that variable view model so that you'll be able to see them, but which one's which. So I have a model. And what's its type? Anyone want to guess what the type of this model, my model is here? No guesses? It's a memory game of string, right? Because I said this was an emoji memory game. And so it's going to create a memory game. That model is of type string. Everybody cool with that? I just took that generic type and Specified the don't care. The don't care is a string right there. Well, now nah, let's let's not go over time. Uh, I'll stop. So we have two errors, two things to do right off the bat. We'll do on Monday. One, it's saying emoji uh, memory game has no initializers. See, it has no init. And remember, I told you that classes only get a free init, which initializes nothing. And this var has not been initialized. So that's why it's making this complaint right here. So we'll have to fix that, obviously. And the other thing I'm going to do right off the bat on Monday is talk a little bit what I was telling you about the partial separation versus the full separation uh, mechanism. We're doing full separation here because we're creating a view model in between, but I'm going to show you how this model can be protected. Right now, the UI could see this model because it's just a var in my class. It can see the view model if you see it, but I'm going to protect it so that they can't see it. So the UI cannot see it, and then I'm going to be a gatekeeper. So we'll start that off on Monday, and then we'll implement the rest of this, and then we'll go make our UI use all this stuff. All right, that is it.